Good morning. Good to see so many people out this morning. We have a great number here and we have many visitors. We know that some of you have traveled near and far. We're glad to have you with us. And for all those who might have found our YouTube channel, our live stream this morning on Courthouse Church of Christ, uh, welcome. We're glad that you've tuned in to us this morning. This morning's lesson is entitled New Testament Greetings, taking our text from 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. I want us to begin reading there, if you don't mind. We're going to turn there to, right now to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. We're going to be looking at many greetings throughout the, the congregations of the New Testament. And I want us to be thinking of this verse as we do that. That's why I wanted to read it first. We are going to reference it. We're going to look at it a little later on. But I wanted us to look at it now when he says we are to the Lord's body, the members of the church are to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know, greetings are important. A greeting usually sets the tone for the rest of the conversation, whether it's by letter or by word. And I get it, sometimes you get a text, and it's, sometimes it's, it's hard to tell the inflection of voice in a text, unless you know the person. Are they teasing? Are they joking? Is that sarcasm? Was that a sick burn? Did they mean it? <laughs> you know, all those different things. A greeting can say a lot about how the conversation is going to go. When, you, when your friend or your girlfriend or boyfriend or your husband or wife says, we need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> or they say, hey, we haven't seen any, a friend says we haven't seen each other in a while. Let's talk and let's catch up. We kind of know the, the tone of that conversation from that point, right? When your boss calls you in his office and he does it like this, you know, <laughs> it might not be the best conversation that's coming. However, I have had that, that symbol from my boss before, and it wasn't about me. It was about someone on my team. I was in management, and he's saying, you need to handle that. And so it wasn't me. He was saying, you get to have the unpleasant conversation. <laughs> but I've also had your boss call you in and go like this. You know, come here. I got some news to share. And so there's greetings say a lot about the tone of the conversation. Often you can tell if a conversation will be light, if it'll be serious, if it'll be positive, negative, sad, or happy by the greeting that starts it all. In Acts chapter 2, after the first saints were baptized into Christ as a result of gladly receiving the word, as the way Acts 2.41 and the New King James reads, we see them added to the church and we see them begin developing spiritually. Acts 2.42 and Acts 2.44 through 47, they begin diving into the apostles' teaching. They begin following and holding fast the doctrine of the apostles. And in time, those first converts either stay in Jerusalem or they go back to their territories. When you go back into the early part of chapter 2 and read, you can find 15 provinces of Rome that the Jews came to Jerusalem from. And so as these converts go back, <clears throat> there, there were no churches established there. This was the beginning of the church. And so as they go back to their homes, they need to convert their friends, their family, and their neighbors and start congregations there. And these various churches gain reputations based on the influence of the brethren that made up those particular churches. Churches still today gain reputations based on the influence of their individual members. A church can be remembered for its love, its coldness, its faithfulness, it's apostasy, it's unfaithfulness, and the list goes on and on and on. I've shared with you many times before, Becky and I went into a congregation long ago in, in Anchorage, Alaska. And when we walked in, we were greeted by one single older man. When we sat down, nobody talked to us, nobody said anything to us. And at the end of services, everyone kind of spread out through the side doors, everyone left. And that old man that talked to us in the beginning asked us if we were going to lock up. <laughs> He said, don't forget to lock the door when you leave. And we're like, whoa, 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 you lock up, we'll leave. I, I mean, what do you think our, our memory of that congregation is? We didn't see them visit with each other. They didn't visit with us. It, it seemed like a cold group. And granted, over time, we've, we've said, you know, maybe they had a bad day. Maybe there was something that the rest of them were getting to in that afternoon and they were just in a hurry. We try not to be too harsh about it because it was only the one visit. But... 
the one visit that you visit a congregation, you come away with some kind of influence or reputation that you think about, right? I want to tell you how thankful Becky and I are for your love, your support, and your generosity. Because of your love, your support, and your generosity, you sent us around the world, or half, half around the world, to land on the continent of Africa, where we landed on the east coast in a place called Tanzania. We landed in Dar es Salaam, and there we worked with six congregations. And we took your greetings to every single one of them and greeted those brethren warmly and kindly and with love from you. And I have the, pr the privilege and the honor to bring back warm greetings from those same six congregations from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And while this is not my report, and there's so much more I want to tell you about it, next week we're going, I'm going to talk to you about our trip. That'll be my official report of what we did in Tanzania, our mission, what our work was, who we met. But this morning, I want to bring you back the warm greetings from the church in Mbezi. We worked with this congregation for four days, and this picture was taken at the end on Wednesday as we were ending. I want to tell you about that Sunday we were there. When they do a count, they did a count three ways. They broke it down this way. There were 45 men, 56 women, and 56 children for a grand total of 157 people there that Sunday that we visited with them. The children were amazing, 56 children, hearing their voices sing because they all sang out. We were so encouraged, and they wanted to make sure that we brought back their greetings to you. So greetings from the church in Mbezi. Next, we worked with the congregation at Tabata. This is the congregation at Tabata. This was their group on a, month, on a uh, Thursday night. The church sends their greetings from Chanika. This was a group on a Friday night that came out to hear us speak to them. And then greetings from the church in Kizwani and the Diego household. When we were there Friday or we were there Saturday night and we did not get a group shot of the entire congregation at the building, but on, or I'm sorry, that was uh, uh, Saturday night. But then on Tuesday, we were invited back to the preacher's house, Brother Diego Godwin, uh, or Godwin Diego. <laughs> we hear his name both ways, uh, but we think it's Godwin Diego. He invited us to a house study with him on Tuesday, and we did get this group shot there, and many of the people that were at his house were from Kizwani and from other places, but they, the congregation at Kizwani and the Diego household wanted us to bring their greetings back to you. And then on Sunday, we worked with the church at Monambaya <clears throat> and the Mwakiyami household. Zuberi Mwakiyami, that's this man right here. He's our guide and the local preacher that we work with. When we go there, he went with us everywhere. Uh, after our first four days in Mbezi, he was our main translator. And his, the congregation meets at his house. And so just as Paul gave a shout out to Priscilla and Aquila in Romans 16 for how, hosting the church in their home, I do the same for the Makiami family. The congregation meets at their house. They had over 60 people that Sunday. We were there meeting at their home. And so they send their warm greetings. And then finally, we worked with the congregation in Kingugi, and they wanted us to bring their greetings back to you. So we bring back warm greetings from these six congregations in Tanzania. These your brothers and sisters who you have not met, but send their warmest greetings to you. As we look at New Testament greetings, they are a tribute of character, and they can teach us the importance of the local church being a recipient of good positive and faithful greetings. So I want us just to look at a few of the New Testament greetings that we can find. And I want to start with the church in Rome. To the church in Rome, Romans 1.8 says, First, I thank my God through Christ Jesus for you all because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. Brethren, how would you like to receive a letter from an apostle that said, Your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. This is an amazing intro to the letter to the saints at Rome. He says to the church in Rome, your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world, and I thank God for you. What a commendation and compliment to their faithfulness. 1 John 5, 4 I have on the slide says, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And Paul says to the church at Rome, you're doing it. To the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1, 11, he says, for I've been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Uh-oh. 
Not the intro you want to get, especially after reading the intro to the church at Rome. The church at Corinth had many problems. This is just the beginning of those, but it's in the very beginning of his letter. And then Paul is going to address several of those concerns throughout his first letter to the Corinthians. Not a glowing report of the Lord's body, and it's not the good start to a letter that you want to hear. In fact, James 4, 1 to 4 tells us that to fight or to quarrel or to divide is works of the flesh. He says, James 4, 1 to 4, quarrels and conflicts come about because of selfish ambitions and greed. To the church in Galatia, I'm going to read from the New King James here in Galatians 1, 6. I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Not a good way to start off a letter. And Paul is going to spend the rest of the letter trying to get them to correct course. Because he says, you are listening to the wrong people. You are not listening to a new gospel. You're listening to a perversion of it. And you need to change course. Later on, he's going to refer to them as being foolish. It's frustrating. And it's sad to see faithful brethren turn to apostasy. It's not just unfaithfulness where we become unfruitful, but where we actually latch onto something that is false and begin teaching that. That was the danger here for the Galatian saints. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. Paul warned Timothy, who was at Ephesus, he said, from inside the faith, there will be those who turn from the faith, from the truth, aside to myths and fables and lies. To the church in Ephesus, we get two Greetings to the church at Ephesus. The first one is, historians say this was around A.D. 61 to 62. The date doesn't so much matter as we understand it's a very early letter to the church at Ephesus. And it is from the Apostle Paul. Ephesians 1, 15 to 16 says this. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. What a glowing commendation and a great start to a letter. Paul says, I think of you in my prayers. I mention you in my prayers because you have faith in the Lord which exists among you. And we've heard about your love for all the saints. Whatever the brethren were doing here, they were doing something right. The report here from Paul says, you have love for all the saints. So much that Paul says, I mention you in my prayers. And then we have to wonder, what happened in about a 30-year span? Around AD 95 to 96, we read another intro to a letter to the church at Ephesus. By Jesus, through the Apostle John, Revelation 2, 2 through 5, <clears throat> I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. And wouldn't we love it, wouldn't the Ephesus saints love it if the letter from Jesus stopped there? But it kept going. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. When we go back to Revelation chapter 1, we find the significance of the lampstand symbolism. The lampstand represents a church, a body of Christ, the church that belongs to Jesus. And when he says, I'm going to remove its lampstand out of its place, he's saying, you no longer belong to me. They were in danger of no longer being a church of Christ. They were in danger of no longer representing the body of Christ. This was not a, a light accusation. He says, I have this against you. You left your first love. He called them fallen and calls on them to repent. But again, I remind you of the letter from Paul. Just 30 or so years before that, he says they had faith in the Lord. It existed among them and they had love for all the saints. And then Jesus says, you left that first love. What causes that? What causes that? Our love for one another is the demonstration of our belonging to Jesus John 13, 35, Jesus says we are to love one another as he loved us, and in this way the world will know that we belong to him. They'll know that we're his disciples because of our love. The Ephesian saints once had that love, and they lost it. 
I don't know if the song is playing in your head, but you've lost that love and feeling. <laughs> right? That's what Jesus is saying to the saints at Ephesus. And they need to return to that loving feeling. They better go back to that first love, else they're in danger of him removing their lampstand. It's not something light. It's not something to say, well, it's okay, as long as we're doing everything else. Remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13? No matter what I do, no matter how great the spiritual gift, no matter how great the prophecy, no matter what the deed is, if I don't have love, what is it? It's like a clinging symbol. It is useless and it is futile. Jesus is telling the saints at Ephesus, you better change course. You need to repent. Our love for God is our motivation for obedience. 1 John 4.19 says, we love because he first loved us. Brethren, if we don't have love, It'll be evident. It'll be seen. It'll be noticed by others. It'll be noticed by the visitors among us. It'll be noticed, most and important of all, by Jesus himself. He'll know of our group. But we move on to the church in Philippi, Philippians 1, 3 through 6. <clears throat> I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. What a commendation to the church at Philippi. He says, you have participated in the gospel from the very first day, from the day they believed, until the day he's writing this letter. He says, you are teaching others the gospel. It's not just something that you obeyed and then you ignored. You are actively participating in it. What a commendation to this group. He's saying they, they're growing. And he says he remembers them all the time in his prayers to God because of the report of this church in Philippi. At the time of Paul's letter, this church was faithful. And I'm reminded again of the passage we read earlier in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, being steadfast and immovable. Paul is commending the saints at Philippi for that very thing. And the church in Colossae. Colossians 1, 4 through 6. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, very similar to the Ephesus congregation, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world, also it's constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it's been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Again, just like the Philippian church, the saints in Philippi, from the day they heard of the gospel and they obeyed it, they were teaching it, they were actively participating in it. He says to the saints at Colossae, he's heard of their faith, he's heard of their love for all the saints. And then he talks about they are a growing group. Their congregation is constantly bearing fruit. They are increasing. He says you have obeyed it, you understood it, and you continue to grow in the grace of God and truth. What a commendation. This church here was known for its faith, its love, its hope, and its productiveness. Matthew 13, 23, as Jesus is describing the parable of the sower, this is the good soil saints. The good soil saint is the one that from a good heart produces fruit. Tenfold, thirtyfold, a hundredfold. The church at Colossians, or the Colossian saints, the church at Colossae, they were growing, they were abounding. And to the church in Thessalonica. We get two greetings to the church in Thessalonica. Paul writes two letters to them. And I want to look at both of these greetings. First Thessalonians 1, 2 through 3. And then verses 6 to 9. They're on the slide. We give thanks to God always for all of you. Making mention of you in our prayers. So again, he's, he's mentioning this group and saying, I remember you in my prayers. Constantly bearing in mind. So he says, I'm always thinking about what you're doing. He says, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. I want you to remember 1 Corinthians 15, 58, always abounding in the work of God, steadfast, immovable. He says, your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope. Again, this group is a faithful congregation. He says, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. He says, it wasn't peacetime when we taught you the gospel. 
There was much tribulation. There was a lot going on in your world. And yet you obeyed it. And then he says, for the word of the Lord has, or he says, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. He says, you have, you've become an example of what faithful Christians look like to everyone in the surrounding areas. Notice verse 8, for the word of the Lord is sounded forth from you. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. Brethren, I don't know about you, but I wonder what this group thought when they read this letter from Paul. He says, your influence, your example has influence the neighborhoods around you the, the communities around you the provinces around you he says the sound the word of the lord is sounded forth from you this was not an apathetic group this was a group that was growing they were actively teaching and involved with their neighbors their friends and their families he says you turn to god from idols to serve a living and true god and not just themselves but they're influencing a host of other people so much that paul says we've heard it reported to us and so I'm always bearing in mind when I go to God in prayer what's being accomplished with you. I'm reminded of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and we don't have time to turn there now. But in 2 Corinthians 11, as Paul is recounting the different things that, it took, that uh, happened to him bodily, uh, beaten time without number, danger around every corner, shipwrecked. He says not only that, but he has the, the constant turmoil of the church on his mind daily. And I wonder if this is one of the congregations that he's thinking of. Not just the ones in trouble like Galatia, but the ones like the Thessalonians who are busy preaching and teaching. Paul's not alone. He, he can't stand in a cave like Elijah once did and say, I'm all alone, oh woe is me. He knows that he's not alone. There are Christians that are doing the work of teaching and preaching and being good and faithful servants of Christ. And then he sends a second greeting to them in 2 Thessalonians 1, 3 through 4. He says, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged. Wait a minute. Wasn't it enlarged the first letter? He says, it's enlarged, and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. This was a congregation that loved one another. They loved others so much so that they taught their friends, their family, and their neighbors. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. It wasn't all rosy with them. It wasn't all peace. They were experiencing persecution for their faith. They were, they were experiencing afflictions because of their faith. And Paul says, but you and have endured it all. And for that, we proudly speak of you. Wouldn't we want to receive a letter such as this. Not once, but twice. Paul says, you're known for your love. You're known for your faith. And here he says, your faith is greatly enlarged and your love for one another continues to grow. Brethren, let us never become complacent and think, uh, my faith is where it needs to be. I love my brothers and sisters mm, adequately enough right now. We need to let our faith continually grow. Let our love for one another continually grow. God sees it. Jesus sees it. The Apostle Paul had this report and he wanted to let them know that they were doing what Matthew 5.16 said. Jesus said, let your light shine before men in such a way they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Paul gave thanks to their Father in heaven because of what he heard they were doing. They had a positive influence far and wide. And then we turn to the book of Revelation. We already looked at the, the letter to the church at Ephesus, but I'm going to go through these pretty fast to the church in Smyrna, Revelation 2, 9 to 10. They were commended for their faith. To the church in Pergamum, Revelation 2, 13 to 16. Some were faithful, some were not. They were called on to repent. To the church in Thyatira, Revelation 2, 19 to 21, they were called for their, they were commended for their steadfast love and faith, but also they tolerated sin, and Jesus called upon them to repent. To the church in Sardis, 
chapter 3, 1 to 2, he says they were hypocrites. They had a reputation of being an alive church, but he said, but you are dead. And he called on them to repent, and he didn't have a whole lot of good things to say about the congregation in Sardis. Again, they were in danger of their lampstand being removed, and they needed to do something about it. To the church in Philadelphia, Revelation 3.8, a congregation he didn't have any con uh, condemnation against. He said they kept God's word. They had not denied him, and he had only positive things to say to them. And finally, to the church in Laodicea, Revelation 3, 15 to 17. He didn't have a whole lot of good to say about them either. They had compromised to the point that there was no difference between them and the world. He said they thought they were rich, but they were actual paupers. They lived in poverty. They thought they were something. And he said, you're nothing. You think that you're clothed, but you're naked. You think that you see, but you're blind. And he calls on them to repent. And to come back to God. As we look through the New Testament greetings, in all these cases, each congregation became known individually as, as groups, collectively, based on the individual faithfulness or the unfaithfulness of the saints that made it up. There were congregations, as we looked at there in, in the churches of Asia, that there was some good happening, but also there was some evil. There was some good, but there was bad. And the ultimate response from Jesus was they needed to repent. When we know of sin in the camp, we need to repent. So what I just wonder as I was putting this together, what would a letter look like to the courthouse church of Christ? When we make it personal to ourselves, the New Testament greetings revealed the reputation of many first century churches. The character of a congregation is very important to the community and to Jesus it's not something light. It's something that matters. It's something of great importance. Learning from the New Testament churches, there are ways the local church can possess a good character, a good reputation, an influence for good. And I want to talk about some of these ways that we can do that. And I recognize these pictures need updating, and we're kind of working on that. There's some things in the work to uh, update these pictures. This was taken six years ago when we first started working with you. And uh, we have done some growing since then, both physically and spiritually. And so we need to update the pictures. But it's the one I have, so I'm using it. But ways we can possess a good character. We need to develop faith. Look how many times Paul commends the congregations that throughout the New Testament epistles for their faith. That they were known for their faith. That their faith was growing. We need to develop faith. Romans 10, 17, 2 Timothy 2:15, 2, 2 Peter 3, 18. This is something that we each individually need to do so that collectively our reputation would shine into the community around us. We need to have a sincere love of the brethren. I loved reading Paul's first letter to the, or his, his letter to the church at Ephesus and his letter to the Thessalonians and to Colossae. They were known for their love for all the saints. We need to have a sincere love of the brethren. Galatians 6, 2, 1 Peter 1, 22, 1 John 4, 7, and 1 John 4, 11 through 12. We need to have this, this sincere love, and others need to see that. John said it, or Jesus said in John 13, 35, when you love one another as he loved us, others will see it, and they'll know who we belong to, and remain steadfast in God and in his work. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Be immovable, be steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord, so that our toil is not in vain. Titus 2, 14 says that we were created for good works, that we are to be zealous for those good works. And Hebrews 3, 14 tells us we are to remain steadfast in God and in his work. Be supportive of preachers and teachers of the gospel. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 11 through 13 we are to be supportive of those who teach the gospel. I loved what he said to the brethren at Thessalonica. He said that they're, they're, they have sounded forth the word of God. It wasn't just the preacher. It was everyone doing what every joint is supposed to supply, as we see in Ephesians 4 and verse 14 to 16. Everyone was working together. And I'm thankful for you. You supported me and my wife going to Africa. I know the cost was great. And you bore it. You generously supported us. We didn't want for anything getting there and while we were there and coming back. And we thought of you often in our prayers. 
because we knew and we understood the sacrifice you made for us to do that. And we are very thankful for that experience and for the opportunity that your generous support provided us to do. You are supportive of preachers and teachers of the gospel. And ways we can possess good character and reputation as a collective group is to teach the gospel to others. 2 Timothy 2.24, 1 Peter 3.15. Here, 1 2 Timothy 2.24 says, The bondservant of the Lord needs to be able to teach. It doesn't say the elders, the deacons, or the preacher. It says the bondservant of the Lord. Men and, men and women, brothers and sisters, we are all bondservants of the Lord. There are ways that each of us in our own roles to God can teach and to preach and influence others around us. And we are to do it. 1 Peter 3.15 says we're always to be ready to give that answer or defense of the hope that is in us. We can grow and possess good character by encouraging and edifying one another. We ought to be uplifting to one another. First, or Romans 14, 19, 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, Hebrews 10, 24. In Hebrews 10, 24, it says we come together to stimulate one another to love and good works. We encourage one another when we're together. We can send cards, letters, make phone calls, text, email. Let others know that you appreciate them. We appreciated the WhatsApp messages we got from some of you, from the emails that I received, asking us how things were going, if we were safe, did we have everything we needed. We appreciated that. We do that for one another to encourage and edify. Edify means to build up. We build each other up in the faith. And show others that Christ is important to your life. Matthew 6, 33, Jesus says, Oh, that God knows we need the necessities of life. And he's willing to add those things to us if we will but put him first and seek first his righteousness and his kingdom. He says the necessities of life, going back earlier in the chapter, those will be added to you. But what's more important is our heart to God, that we make him our priority. How do we do that? What does that look like? Wanting to be at every assembly when possible. I can't tell you how encouraging it was to all these congregations we went to, to see the amount of saints that arrived on a Saturday night, or a Friday, or a Thursday, or Tuesday, or Monday. They wanted to hear the gospel. I'm encouraged when we have gospel meetings, for the good turnouts that we get when people show up in the evening. We know you're busy. We know you just got off work. But we have that heart for God when we want to be at every assembly when possible to be with God's people. When you want to be in Bible class, When you show up prepared, you make sure your children are prepared for their classes because the teachers put in preparation. No matter what age group it is, the teachers put in preparation. Make sure your children are prepared for class. They will see you wanting to serve God, wanting to serve Christ. Being friendly to all who assemble with us. Greeting not only the brethren, but visitors alike. Make it a point to get to know the visitors, to ask them their names, to find out where they're from, what brought them here, whatever they're willing to share. Be friendly, be loving, and finally, be hospitable. Hebrews 13, 2 and 1 Peter 4, 8 to 9 mentions that we are to let love of the brethren be fervent, but we're also to show hospitality. Hospitality, it is a transliterated word. The literal phrase means to show love to strangers. Love to strangers. That's what it means to be hospitable. We're told to be hospitable to one another. We shouldn't be strangers to one another. But hospitality literally means showing love to strangers. Sometimes we say, well, I don't know that person, so I'm not going to, to do something for them. That's not the Christian way. He says, In the Hebrews part, Hebrews 13 verse 2 says, People have entertained angels unaware because they showed love to someone they didn't know. Brethren, show love to strangers. Be hospitable. What report would be heard of us here, this local church in this area called the Courthouse Church of Christ? What report? What greeting would the Apostle Paul or Jesus himself send to us? I don't know. I hope that it looks like the letter to Ephesus and Colossae and the Thessalonians. But we have to remember there were were letters that were sent to the seven churches of Asia. The letters to Galatia, to Corinth, that didn't start off so well. We want it to be a glowing report. We want to hear the commendations, but we also need to make sure that we are correcting the places we know that are weak. 
Everyone likes to hear good things said about them. The Lord's church is no different. We must strive together to be found faithful, to be found abiding in his doctrine, John 15, 4, abiding in Jesus, or else we can do nothing apart from him. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15, 58, abounding in the work that we're tasked to do, that we're loving towards one another and loving to the strangers among us and encouraging one another, and that we're bearing one another's burdens. All of these things are important. They're important for us to do individually, collectively, and for our reputation and character of the church overall. Not every congregation is only defined by one characteristic. I did point that out in some of the letters to the seven churches of Asia where Jesus commends them. He did it at Ephesus as well. He commends them, but then he says, but I have this against you. The letter to an unnamed group by the Apostle John I want to close with. Look with me in 3 John. I want to close with this reading. Not every congregation is only defined by one characteristic. There's good and there's bad. The letter to an unnamed group by the Apostle John had both positive and negative. I want to start in verse 4. In verse 4, he says this, I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. This group that the Apostle John is writing to, they walked in the truth. He then says in verses 5 to 6, Beloved, you're acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they're strangers. He's saying you're hospitable. They're faithful. He says in verse 6, And they, the strangers, and they have testified to your love before the church. You'll do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. He says, you had visitors that came to your group. They were strangers to you. You didn't know them. You sent them on their way. They came back and reported to our church, the church the Apostle John is at, wherever that is, and says, they, they gave a wonderful testimony about you. They talked about how you had love for strangers. They talked about how faithful you were. And so he says, there's no greater love than I have than to hear of my children walking in the truth. So he says, they walked in the truth. They acted faithfully. They showed love to strangers. That is hospitality. But verses 9 to 10, there is someone there who is causing some great distress. He says, I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. The we he's talking about is as an apostle. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does unjustly accusing us with wicked words and not satisfied with this he himself does not receive the brethren either and he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church this is why we read of elders plural this is what happens when there's a one-man rule diotrephes put himself above everyone else and took it upon himself to then forbid those to receive strangers forbid accepting the words of an apostle and anyone that did so he threw them out of the church as he wished and for whatever reason the congregation let him get away with this and we ask how but then probably if I were to ask for a show of hands how many diatrophies have you met in real life would all have a hand to put up and we've all seen it and we wonder why does the congregation put up with such a man but it happens over and over and over again in congregations throughout our country and the world over, there's a diatrophies because no one else stands up to him. And the Apostle John says, when I come, I'm going to stand up to him and I'm going to put him in his place. He says there's positive and there was something negative. They needed to take care of their diatrophies. Greetings are important. They become a tribute of character. The church is as strong and faithful as its members. So I want, to, I want this to be an encouraging lesson for you. I want you to know we took your greetings to congregations in Africa. We let them know of your love for them in sending us and the gifts that you sent with us to give them. And we bring back their warm greetings to you because they know what you sacrificed to send us. And so there was some character there. There was a reputation there. But the church is as strong and as faithful as its members. And so we need to be careful. And as encouraging as I want this to be, I want to say this. As we invite our friends and family to hear the gospel, let us strive together 
individually and collective as the group, to receive a positive greeting from Jesus and to be an influence for good to those around us, that our community might know of our love for one another and for them. And this morning, if you're with us and not a Christian today, I know I didn't cover all the things that you need to do to become a member of the family of God, but you need to hear the gospel, believe in Jesus, repent of your sins, and confess Christ as the true and living God to be baptized into his name for the forgiveness of your sins, and then remain faithful. We looked at this morning of how important it is to be faithful and to grow in your love for the brethren. And if you are a Christian this morning, not living the way that you should, maybe something we said this morning has pricked your heart and you said, I haven't been growing in my faith. I haven't been growing in my love. There's always that one guy or that one gal that I just, ah, (laughs) don't. Make it right before God. Don't face him and be condemned for your lack of love or your lack of growth or your lack of faith. Whatever it is this morning that stands between you and God, repent of it. Make it right now. Whether it's the waters of baptism or the prayers of the congregation on your behalf, come forward. Let your request be known now while we stand.